Hey everybody, before we start, um, I know it's gonna sound like the movies, but if you could turn off your cell phones and any crying babies would be great. So anything you do that makes any noise, we don't wanna have any of that stuff making any noise. So if you could kill those, uh, especially the creators guys, don't forget to kill your cell phones. So put them all on silent, do not disturb. So we promise if anything large happens, we'll ignore it. We're just waiting to see all the kind of funnel in. Okay. Everybody silence your cell phones. Got that done? Okay. Hi, I'm Charles Schwartz, and I'm your host for tonight's event. I'm excited to be joining you for City of Coral Springs' second annual Innovate Downtown, sponsored by Coral Springs, CRA, Blue Stream, Four Geeks Academy, and Prototype House. Whether you're joining us on site or online, we look forward to introducing you to our 12 creators who bring new ideas and innovation to our distinguished panel of judges, and you guys as our guests. Innovate Downtown is about supporting South Florida creators, entrepreneurs, and while celebrating developing an exciting downtown Coral Springs. These creators tomorrow will have booths at Cities Unplugged, featuring music, art, and beer from Frankie Buddha. It'll be here, downtown tomorrow, from 6 to 10 p.m. Before I introduce our judges and our 12 selected creators, I want to speak to you about innovation. So we all know with innovation, and the screen should be coming up here shortly, um, when it comes to innovation, we have specific definitions, and we all learn from it. And there we go. We all have a specific definition about it, what it means, what it takes to actually do it. But we also have some myths that we've been taught. And the first myth that we've been taught is that the cost of entry is simply too high. And this is a century old idea. So if you look at the guy in the, in the picture, he has what's known as a milkshake maker. So he would have to go around from city to city, town to town, restaurant to restaurant, and sell this, this milkshake maker. So his cost of entry was his car, his hotel rooms, and his milkshake maker. Now, most of you don't know who this man is, but that's Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc is the founder of McDonald's. Well, now your cost of entry just skyrocketed, because now you need the land, and then you need the building, 
And then you need the fryers and the stoves and the lettuce and the ding, ding, ding. And God forbid you have a bathroom because now you need the toilet paper and everything else for the bathroom. So it just keeps going and going. This is a century old way of thinking because business doesn't operate like this anymore. Now we have something like Uber. Uber has roughly, they launched about 10 years ago. They have 3 million drivers, have done over 10 billion rides. They own nothing, none of their cars. Their cost of entry when it came to their actual infrastructure was zero. And in fact, if you don't have a car, they'll finance it for you, which created another profit stream for the company. From there, we went into Airbnb. Again, did not exist a decade ago. They have five million rooms. That's more than anyone, all the other competitors combined. 3,000 of them are castles. Castles, we can stay at a castle. I want to stay at a castle. And how many of these houses do they own? None. Zero. And they did it less than 10 years. This isn't unique to them. 15 years ago, when you used to get a cell phone service, they would give you the cell phone for free. You should not have to pay for your seat on airplanes. Now you've got to do both. So the idea of cost of innovation, of, of coming in, and the cost of entry, that's gone now, guys. But the next question is, when we have this problem, well, there's an infrastructure behind it. There's, now, software is divided for our conversations between proprietary and non-proprietary. In other words, you made it or you didn't make it. And when you're having these big organizations and these big things, you have someone like Airbnb. They had 59 programs that make up their entire back end. Six of them are proprietary. They made them. The other 53, open source. You can buy them right now. In fact, I had my assistant test this. It was about $2,500, and it took her about eight hours to do it. By the way, my assistant hasn't massively trained, and she did it from the Philippines, and she's $4 an hour. But that's an easy one, right? That's, that's not like uh, the car one. That's not like Uber. When it comes to Airbnb, you have some warning. Air, you know, when you have the car for Uber, it's instantaneous. Multiple cities, multiple drivers, they all get to bid on it. It's crazy. So to have more. <laughs> no. Uber's got 10 applications on their back end. None of them are proprietary. They're all open. You can get them. You can set this up. It can happen in less than two to four hours. Now, this doesn't include your VC funding. This doesn't include your branding, your marketing, and all that. But as far as the excuse of, well, I don't know how to do it because the back end's too complicated, <laughs> no. The next myth that we have is this idea that I just wasn't educated enough in it. That there just isn't this. Well, if you look at your cell phone, you have all the education in the world. More importantly, you have places like this at Coral Springs, where you can come together and you have angel investors and VCs who will teach you. And people like me who will come and will explain it. And the first thing, if you don't remember anything else I say, it's this. It is never ever what you sell, it's what you solve. For example, if I have a radar detector, and I walk up to you and say, I'm the greatest radar detector creator in the world. I've been certified by the Radar Detector Institute of wherever, it's on the 572 band, it's made of this great thing, this is the greatest one. Versus, this is a great radar detector, and we guarantee it works. In fact, we guarantee you won't get a ticket, and if you do, we'll pay for it. Which one do you want to buy? It's not what you sell, it's what you solve. From there, you have to go through, whenever you're innovating, you have to go through, the first question is, can it be done? As an angel investor, people come to us all the time, and they're like, hey, I want to put a lollipop on the moon. And we're like, <laughs> hmm. Make sure what you're actually trying to do can be done. The second thing is, does your audience want it? Number, th number three is, can they afford it? You're still not done yet, because the final question that you have on that is, will they buy it? Just because I can buy a Ferrari doesn't mean I'm going to buy a Ferrari. There's a whole lot of trips to Switzerland that I would do instead. And the last one that we get this from an IT background is, do you actually want to work with the audience and your clientele? I really wish I would have known that much earlier on. From there, this is Richard Barton, which he'll come up here. Richard Barton is, for those of you who don't know, you will in a second. He had a three-path filter for anything when it came to innovation. One, does it annoy you? Two, does it waste your time? And three, is there an easier way you can make this happen for people? Now, this is theory, so let me give you something practical. So Barton's first problem was, about 15 years ago, why is it so hard to buy a ticket for a plane? I gotta go to all these different sites and get all these things together. This is a pain in the butt, it's wasting my time, it's annoying. So what did he do? He created Expedia and sold it for $500 million. Now he's got a new problem. His second problem was, I have a house. I have to sell my house and now I have all this money, I have to buy another house. But if anyone's worked before in the real estate agency, it's hard to get reliable quotes. So what did he do? 
He created Zillow. He got bought out for $400 million, and he came back into it, and there's some debate on that right now. But these are the processes you go through when you actually want to create and when you want to innovate. From there, we've got JFK. You want to talk about innovation? We all know the famous line. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hot. Now, we all know that. We've all heard that. But most of us don't know the second part of that which is because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept and one we are unwilling to postpone and one which we're willing and intend to win. What did he do there? He declared it. There's been multiple studies on this, and studies show that if you declare something, when you innovate, you're 20% more likely to do this. I grew up down in South Florida, and six miles away is a hospital. My grandfather was my hero. He served in the war. He worked very hard, he raised a family, he was an amazing husband to my grandmother. When he was dying, he reminded me that he retired at 50. And we were talking and I declared in front of him that I was gonna do it by 40. The problem was I didn't. You see, I grew up puh. I couldn't afford the last three letters of poor. Yet at 36, I retired, 37 became a millionaire, 38, I started lecturing at Yale. When you declare something out loud, it's not about creativity. That makes sense. So when we go to this, the question is, what does innovation look like? It looks like a hockey stick. This is what it's called in the industry. This is what Apple looked like for the first 40 years. That's what their stock value did. This is what their actual value of their company did. From there, what does it look like when innovation stops? Well, this is Apple's stock from October to early January. It went from 232 to 142. They dropped almost 40% of value in 3.5 months. Now, is this unique for Apple that they dropped the ball? There was a company that once called Kodak. They were the film company. This is before the digital age where you just took a picture and you got your picture instantly. We used to have to sit around and take pictures and go to Eckerd's and then like three days later or a week later you would get it. They were the film company. No one could touch them. A year and a half before digital marketing was announced, their guys innovated a digital, media, digital photography. They had it a year and a half. And they got together and said, we're not going to release this because this will destroy our market. A year and a half later, someone else did. It's not unique. It happened with BlackBerry. Blockbuster got offered to buy Netflix twice. And they turned it down. So it's not unique. So we talk about innovation shortcuts. First and foremost, never, ever, ever start with the product. Always start with the problem. Work your way backwards from there. People don't buy products or services anymore. They buy stories, identities, or ways out of pain. The easiest way to look at this is if you have someone who has a four by four car, four by four big truck, versus a Prius, who do they vote for? The people who shop at Whole Foods aren't the same people who shop at Winn-Dixie. Know the language of the audience, innovate to them, innovate to their product. Don't build a product and then force it down their throat. Reverse that. Also, Discipline trumps and outperforms creativity all day long. We just had a new year, and a bunch of us said, hey, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to stop smoking, I'm going to do all these things. You have all the resources. You could have got creative, but you didn't do it. Most of us don't do it. In fact, 81% of all the New Year's resolutions never happen beyond the first month. <coughs> Discipline and declaration there. Creativity isn't enough. The last one is don't fight the market. If the market tells you that you are a certain thing, be that certain thing. For example, Apple came out and said, we're a computer company. And the market went, no, you're not. You're a phone company. Amazon, we all know what Amazon is. They sell services. They sell stuff online. Pretty simple stuff. They didn't make profit in that sector until last year. Their Amazon Web Services, which most of you guys will just know is the cloud, hosts Netflix, Yelp, all the big boys, they made $10.4 on that last year or the year before. But you guys know them as an e-commerce site. Don't fight the market. You'll lose. The last thing that's important is if you want to go go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's what this is about here at Coral Springs. Coming together where you can spend time with your family and you can innovate with some of the best investors and the best angels and mentors that you can get your hands on. Come here together. Because that's what it is. Because your network is your net worth. If anybody you guys want the slides, because I've done a lot of these and everybody wants the slides, just email me. I'll get you the slides. They're right there. So. With that in mind, for those of you live on Facebook, hello.
Um, we invite you to join us tomorrow at City Signature Outdoor Music Festival, Ugplug, from 6 to 10 p.m., where we announce the winners. We have live music, food, and beer from Funky Buddha Brewery. We're going to be selecting not only in showing the judges' favorites, but also the crowd favorites as well. Now, I had to pause there for a reason, because we're cutting the, the things off. So we are so fortunate to have 12 talented individuals. <laughs> we're doing some homework here. Individuals pitching their ideas and distinguished judges. And this is who they are. They're over here. And we'll get to them. But before I do that, we have to introduce our creator. Our creators, we have to introduce our judges. And we're bringing them chairs. Didn't they do a great job bringing chairs? Our first judge, and I apologize to anyone named that I mess up, so I'll hide from you guys. Matthew Bordy. All right. He's a serial entrepreneur and product development professional. He is the founder of Prototype House, which is a resource for inventors, entrepreneurs, and large brands looking for help with designing, prototyping, and engineering, and manufacturing. Matthew is also a board member for Gold Coast Venture Capitals Group and a mentor at FAU Tech Runway. My alumni. <laughs> Our next judge is Rafael Hernandez. He has extensive experience, experience in strategic investments with more than 20 years of proven results in the commercial real estate industry. Currently, Mr. Hernandez is the president of PIMO Capital and Fund and found CoSuite. An active member of the New World Angels, Angels, a group of accredited private investors, operators, and entrepreneurs dedicated to providing equity capital to startup companies. Barry Spiegel started and sold several, several multi-million dollar companies. Since 2004, Barry has been the founder, chairman, and CEO of Amerimax Investments, a company that invests in business and real estate. During the past five years, Barry has been a member of the New World Angel Investors and invested with a group in 14 Florida startup companies. So again, your network's your net worth, guys. Get down here, work together. Our last... <laughs> Our last judge is Randall Wood. He is a serial entrepreneur and as a professional investor. He has founded and co-founded many companies. Of these, the most successful in Denver is Citrix Systems. And as an investor, Mr. Wood ran his own commercial real estate investment company that has been active angel investor for over 20 years. For our audience, I will introduce each one of our creators. They will have three minutes to talk, and then after that, they'll have about two, three minutes for the judges to ask them questions. We'll be setting up, and then in between that, I will be asking the judges questions about their, in their field. Our first presenter is Simone Mansour of Clog Never created an anti-clogging solution to prevent air conditioning and other weather leaks. Hello, my name is Simon Mansour. I'm the uh, inventor and the owner of Clog Never. Um, the product, it's for eliminating the drain and AC floods in a house. Uh, when I was a contractor, I used to go when I get a call for a flood, I'll go out and I'll just blow the line, clean it, drop a solution in it and leave. And that was the end of it. And then, um, I become an inspector, and I started inspecting houses. And uh, I started seeing a lot of people asking why did they change their air conditioning in eight years time, 10 years time. When I asked the reason why they changed it in the first place, they said they come home, they came home and it was water all over the floor, and the contractor came in and he told them your AC is shut. So um, I said that, I mean, I don't tell them that, but an AC don't go bad in 10 years, 12 years. Um, so uh, what it is, is I came out with this product that keep dripping uh, 10 drops every 10 days. It shoots into your drain line, keeping the clog, the, the, the mold and the thing that grows in your pipe out. And 
uh, letting the flow of, uh, of water just flow into the outside, not into your homes. So uh, this is, that's the, the product that's, uh, that's out there. This one is the only product in the world. I have a patent. There is no other product like it. Uh, so this is Clog Never. Thank you. I don't have no competitors. The product is the only product out there. Um, the only problem that I have is homeowners don't know about it. Contractors, they don't want to touch it because it takes money out of their, because six out of their 10 calls, it's actually floods. And they don't want to put the product, I would say 80% of them, they don't want to touch it. But I have a patent that there is no other product like it in the world. You have sales right now. I'm selling through Amazon and my website, but not strong, not as I ex expected. I'm selling like about three, four a week. And how old is the patent? How old is the patent? The patent I got uh, for the last two years, 2016. What, what are your current sales? It's, it's about three, three, four a week. Um, I just went to a show uh, uh, association, the, the homeowner association. That's when I started selling for condos. I started getting like 100 units at the time. Now that I'm doing some shows and homeowners mostly. Do you have any projections as to what kind of revenue you expect the next two or three years? Um, if I have my, the right crowd, I, I, would, I, would be, I would be maybe 10,000 units a year if I have the right crowd. What would that amount um, to in sales? What does um, the units cost? The unit costs in Amazon $45, in my website is $40. Um, and that's two years of, of treatment of the AC. That's, that's how much it, co the, it sells. So if you sell through Amazon, that means uh, the homeowner has to install this themselves? Yes. It, is that difficult? No, it's plug and play. It's actually just come and put it in. What it is, it's now it's <clears throat> the code, uh, you have to have what it's called the clean outs. You have to have this in your AIC when you install it. Right. So you just come in, this one comes in a kit, you just put this one here and then you put your unit and then you press this button and you're good to go. So have you considered the commercial market? Um, not yet. I'm fighting with the residentials, hoping with the residential. So, suggestion, uh, a lot of uh, retail and small office buildings use package systems, just like in residential, but they have their own maintenance staff, and they're interested in saving money, uh, probably, so sell to the maintenance staff, and they have lots of units to apply it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And it's perfect for the, it comes in this bottle, it comes in 16 ounces bottle as well for the commercial, commercial side. Thank you, Samal. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So why Christina Rodriguez is joining us from Mine and Medley to showcase her innovation for interactive music programs, which, we, which have educational and therapeutic benefits for those with neurological impairments. When you guys are setting up, I'm gonna ask the judges some questions. So come on up and set up. So one of the things that happens when we're innovating as entrepreneurs is getting capital isn't always the easiest thing. So being able to do that is challenging. So when we get to this option of having VC funded, what would be some advice that you would have on that? So if you have a business that you want to start, um, generally the progression is you start with uh, family and friends to uh, invest in you, basically in you, <laughs> because they know you. And then, um, then you look to angel investors like our group, uh, New World Angels. Um, and usually at that stage, you probably have a product. Uh, we, pr we don't like idea companies. Um, and then, uh, and then you move into the venture capital world, uh, early stage uh, VCs, and then later stage VCs. 
So you, ha uh, you have to keep in mind the progression of raising money. <clears throat> when you talk about later stage VCs versus early VCs, mm -hmm. what are the differentiators there? So later stage, there are many uh, later stage VCs, for example, that say, uh, you need 10 million in revenue and 3 million in profits before we talk to you. And the money is used to expand your business, build a new factory or something, you know. Perfect, thank you. Are you guys ready? All yours. <clears throat> Generally, when people hear that somebody has Alzheimer's, they think it's just memory loss, but it's so much more than that. They begin to lose pieces of themselves, okay. their personality, their sense of humor, their ability to communicate with their friends and family. Alzheimer's affects over 5 million people in the U.S., and there is no cure. At Mind and Melody, we crave collaborative music experiences for individuals experiencing neurological impairments. We work with over 40 healthcare facilities in South Florida, helping over 1,000 older adults and kids. So our days are made up of these wonderful moments, uh, these wonderful moments that we share with these individuals who are so isolated and disconnected, like the moments we shared with Olga. Olga used to come into our sessions. She would be hunched over in her wheelchair. Her eyes would be closed, unresponsive. But whenever we played Besame Mucho, her head would raise up, her eyes would go up in the sky, her eyes would go up, and she would sing, Bersame Mucho. And she didn't care what key she was in, she didn't care if she was on beat, the only thing that mattered that we were playing her favorite song. Music is a universal language, but instead of us telling you what we do, we're gonna show you. All right, so there's a little song we like to play called Hound Dog. But I like to add in some howls and some barks. So judges, everybody, can I hear your best howl like this? Oh, hear it. Okay, here we go. So when Christina points the microphone at you, it's your turn to howl. Here we go. Oh, you ain't a nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. You ain't a nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. Oh, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. Here we go, everybody. Oh, 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 Some good howlers here. <laughs> um, how how do you scale the business? How do you replicate yourself? Yeah, so that's something that we're working on right now. We need to fix our internal infrastructure um, to create an application that would be able to scale what we're currently doing from Miami all the way to the Treasure Coast. So, are you selling this concept now at all? Anyone? Yes, so we work with over 40 healthcare facilities and also individuals at home. And what do they pay and what kind of profits are you anticipating? So we're a nonprofit organization. Our goal is to be a uh, sustainable organization. So we have a fee for service model. We also have grants that help um, individuals that sometimes cannot afford our sessions. The program varies on frequency. So it could be as many times that a facility may need depending on the needs of the facility. Um, and it can be tailored uh, for small groups, large groups, or individuals at home. And, and how many uh, facilities are you doing so far? 40. And where are they located? From Miami all the way to the Treasure Coast. And how many um, musicians? Mus musicians do you <laughs> we have over 40 musicians. And there, uh, one for each location? Uh, we have um, two to three professional musicians per location. Okay, and they volunteer their time? Uh, they're professional paid musicians. Oh, they get paid. Mm -hmm. And where does the money come from to pay them? So the, it's a fee-for-service model. The facility pays for the program, or we have grants that can help subsidize it for individuals if needed. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. How are you guys getting the word out now? Like your marketing plan, getting new musicians? What's your plan to scale? Sure, so we use Facebook uh, to recruit a lot of our musicians and um, facilities generally by attending networking meetings. Um, there is, you know, uh, telemarketing. It's very, very helpful for us and that's really the strategy we're using right now. What, what are you guys looking for? As your funding or? 
What's yeah, your so funding we're looking for nonprofit is a little different than when you're in for profit, right? It's harder to find money for capacity building. That's really what we're looking for. There are foundations out there or social investors that will invest in that that can help us scale. And some of that, the money that we're looking for is to help you know revamp our infrastructure, basically a technology to be able to hold the capacity that we need. <laughs> yes, it's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. Company. Um, every year, know, and, right? and actually by 2023, Miami Dade County landfill is slated to fill up, and they have no idea what to do with the waste. Broward County and many other cities are not far behind. Many solutions in South Florida has been to ship that waste to the islands. We tried to sell it to Georgia, and they told us no, um, because they too have some of the same issues. Um, landfills are being filled up with plastic and styrofoam, and we can't legislate ourselves out of this problem. The product that we have is called Earthware. It's made 95% of potato and 5% of soy. Again, that's 95% potato and 5% soy. So this product can dissolve and degrade within 45 days. Plastic takes between 200 and 300 years if it degrades at all. We can produce this product also cost competitive to plastic. So plastic is generally around, um, plastic is generally around three cents a unit and we can produce this at four cents a unit. So a penny more for a better world is our campaign. Thank you. So um, my understanding then is you're manufacturing this? Yes, locally in Medley. And uh, what does it cost and what are the profits? So um, plastic costs about um, three cents a unit and we can produce this for four. We also have a recapturing model so we can produce this. We're looking at B2B contracts, so we're not looking at consumer contracts. Um, as a result of that, I just finished the MBE status. We have um, a distributor to look at contracts with airports, cruise ships, um, hospitals, big companies, because the only way to affect the product is to go after larger contracts. Um, Miami-Dade County schools contract or any school contract, we are talking about a $5 million contract for one um, order. Why would the business buy this product? So the recapturing model allows us to get it down below that of plastic, around 2.7 cents, um, because we collect the waste. So that's the model. And these can be reproduced up to four times. So we would use our, our resin over and over again. Do you, um, do you have any sort of um, intellectual property protection patent or whatever? No. The reason that this product has not been mass produced in America is simply an, a loss of access to the manufacturing, which I know you know, which is why your business has really started to target that issue. A lot of times these things have to be produced overseas, but you're ruining the carbon footprint by doing that because you have to then transport it, right? And by doing this in micro shops and producing it locally, we can be cost competitive while protecting the environment. But, um, you know, as far as competitors go, if you don't have a patent, somebody else could copy what you're doing. Yeah, the resin isn't, it's about who owns the resin and how can they produce it. Yeah, the resin is not necessarily, it's potatoes. Like, we all have access to potatoes. Everybody just decides to use them differently, and we decided to make them into a spoon. So we can't, you know, it's a potato. I have uh, a line of products, uh, plates, cups, and... Uh, yep. Uh -huh. Everything's right here. Front and in the back. What, what are the current sales from last year to this year? I know um, mm -hmm. you guys were here last year, and um, I'm just curious on what 
what you guys have done in the past? Yeah, so in the past year, our main thing has been focused on creating the distribution partnerships um, and getting the business status so that we can go over those larger contracts. These kind of products don't make sense sitting on a shelf somewhere. And so we aren't looking for, we, we, we've got the small juice bar that we work with and the small coffee shop just to test the product, but that's not the kind of contracts that we're looking for. We're in the bidding process with two large entities, and so that's really where we're going. Mm -hmm. And you know those things, government bids take years and time, but once you get them, you're like, you made it, so. Does um, it affect the taste of the uh, food? It does all? not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. If anything, it makes it better, right? You're eating soup. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we've all heard of cryptocurrencies. Our next presenter, Art Rosenblum, has a simple safe Bitcoin solution to safety hold and maintain Bitcoins, locking up their dollar value. Art, coming up. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Give the clicker over a slide. I'll be showing my startup today. Simple safe Bitcoin. Simple safe Bitcoin is different than most Bitcoin startups. We uh, only do a single thing. We help people buy and hold Bitcoins. We we mostly target a very specific market segment, underserved. Markets, they're markets that don't have access to banking services. Our first uh, clients, they're the medical cannabis <laughs> industry. That industry has a lot of profits. They don't have any way to store them. They're currently storing it as paper dollars that are sitting on shelves. So. Um, here's a clip of, okay, um, that's not going. So that video basically wow. shows. what a problem. <laughs> um, it's hard to get a bank account if you're a cannabis business. Even here in Florida, I read the story about the woman who's running for ag commissioner, I think. Nikki. She got her Wells Fargo account right. shut down. <laughs> She doesn't touch the plant. She's not even in the business, right? Right. Um, an elected official, really? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a big problem. So Bitcoin solves that issue entirely. Uh, so why don't these people do it now? Um, because it's very hard, um, and it takes a lot of skill to hold Bitcoin safely. And these individuals don't have that skill, so we offer that service to them in the Bitcoin. Oh, that's I, I, we don't do Bitcoin, um, not because I don't want to do Bitcoin. I just don't understand it. Um. <laughs> so we offer two distinct products. The first is the typical Bitcoin. They just buy and hold it. We maintain their passwords and everything. The other option is the dollar peg option. They do a deposit that um, oh, uh, stays the same value the entire time. Time's up. Thank you. So, our, um, explain how this... Um, um, dollar-based uh, Bitcoin works. It sounds like in order to, Bitcoin is very volatile. It is. And so somebody's got to take the risk of that volatility. Who, how do you do that? So the short answer is most of these people, they're happy to take that volatility risk themselves because they don't have uh, 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 the option to store their money in a savings account. 
So, so as opposed to having a box full of $100 bills sitting on a shelf somewhere, the volatility of Bitcoin is fine. However, the peg choice that we give them, it um, saves that value as the dollar value, so it doesn't go down if Bitcoin goes down, but it doesn't go up either if Bitcoin goes up. So it's currently, we're doing it through stable coins. We're developing different choices to do it too, but it currently functions through stable coins. Got it, thanks. Take the cash, you know, just drop the cash off. And we have some banking partnerships. It would be depositing cash through the ATMs. Do you currently. Have any current clients now, or where's the platform? We're talking to five license holders now. Uh, two of them that are in Florida, a uh, Denver license holder, California license holder, and a Washington State license holder, and we'll be doing beta services starting in two, two months. We're just uh, finalizing some banking uh, issues currently, and we're planning on taking deposits in two and a half months. All right, uh, is only Bitcoin or can you use other currencies? We're only doing it through Bitcoin because these people, they're, they're not interested in doing investments. They're only interested in a, in a safe store of wealth. So they're not buying and selling, they're only buying and holding. So with Bitcoin, uh, it was as high as what, close to uh, 2,000, uh, 20,000, I mean? Yeah. And it's low now around five, six. It's like three, three or four now, yeah. Okay, so how does that affect what you're trying to do? The so fluctuation. For the typical Bitcoin um, accounts, so if, if somebody uh, put in $10,000 Back in December 2017, today that would probably be worth a thousand or two thousand dollars. But if they did it through the peg <laughs> option, that would stay the same. So it doesn't change based on Bitcoin's volatility; it just stays the same value, similar to how, like, if someone has a has a savings account, he puts in a hundred bucks, depending on how much the dollar changes, his savings account stays at a hundred bucks. So it's an alternative to a savings account. It's not an, so it's not investing. It's just some alternative to banking services for people that don't have the option of of a typical banking service. Thank you. Our next creator is Michael Kilman from Psyche Diagnostic. He's working to develop automated systems that measure cognitive disorders. Michael. Thank you. Hold on to the thing just a that most people in this room have a family member or friend that has died or that has Alzheimer's disease. We need to do something. Unfortunately, we're trying and we're failing. Many pharmaceutical research companies have already completely disbanded their Alzheimer's divisions. And this is because of two reasons. The first is that Alzheimer's causes permanent brain damage. And by the time someone's diagnosed with the disorder, it is already too late for any kind of treatment to work. And second, it is difficult, time consuming, and expensive to actually measure cognitive impairment. So even if treatment is found, determining how well it works is going to be very difficult. My name is Michael Kleiman. I'm the CEO and founder of Psyche Diagnostics, and we believe we have developed a way to solve both of these issues. The Psyche Scan is a user-friendly, non-invasive, rapid, and completely automated method to detect and measure Alzheimer's disease. This 20-minute test examines how patients think in far more detail than existing methods, because we simply investigate how patients look at and talk about different scenes, videos, and pictures, instead of asking them to perform different tasks, complex tasks. Take, for example, this picture of some zebras. If their instructions are to count the number of zebras, 
a healthy participant will do just that. However, someone with Alzheimer's might wander or maybe not even look at the zebras for most of the time. This task has been shown to accurately measure cognitive strategy, speed, and the ability to follow instructions. But instead of needing a human to actually compare these two pictures and these two task performance, our solution uses artificial intelligence to automatically analyze the differences between these two pictures and determine whether it's from someone with Alzheimer's or without. And this is just one task that we use. There are 15 different tasks that are each scientifically validated individually. However, without our proprietary model, incorporating all of these into a single exam would be extremely difficult, if not impossible. After the exam, uh, we provide doctors and researchers with cognitive exam scores. For example, memory, attention, strategy, and speed. Doctors can use these to help guide their diagnoses, and researchers can use these to evaluate the efficacy of their, of their research. But probably most useful is our model's ability to generate a likelihood or risk factor for Alzheimer's up to 15 years in advance based on this, this data that we use. A 2018 study by the Alzheimer's Association found that early detection of Alzheimer's could save $8 trillion in healthcare costs. At Psyche Diagnostics, we hope to make these potential savings a reality. current sales do you have? Where are you in the rollout? So currently we're in the uh, probably the prototype or pre-prototype model. Um, so I've uh, created this based on my research as a doctoral student. Um, so right now we're trying to get the funding to actually collect the equipment. That eye tracking equipment will let us um, collect participant data from both <laughs> Alzheimer's patients and healthy patients. And then we will use our model to compare the two. Follow-up so question. Um, for, you said you had um, proprietary format yes. uh, for your test. What are you doing to protect that? Uh, so we are in the middle of writing a, a uh, provisional patent. Um, that patent, um, well, I'm not going to go into the details right now, but it basically goes over um, the structure of our model, um, the, the way that we kind of incorporate the model with the eye tracker that we have partnered with uh, an eye tracker manufacturer. Um, and it would protect a couple of other things, a couple of the tasks that we use, but not all of them. How much money are you looking for to get to the next step? And what is the next step? So the next step right now is to collect, we're looking for between 100 and 200 um, participants. Um, so around 50 from Alzheimer's, around 50 to 100 from Alzheimer's, 50 to 100 that are healthy. Um, we need to uh, purchase an eye tracker to do this. Um, those eye trackers, especially the high quality ones, can be pretty expensive. Um, there are two ways we can do this. We can purchase a low quality, one where we can get that proof of concept and show that some of our models will work. Or we can get, um, that will cost about 25,000. Or if we get up to around 70 to 80,000, um, that would allow us to actually, um, to get a more high powered eye tracker and be able to comp compensate our participants uh, to make it more easy to actually get uh, some data. Why, why do you feel that uh, this hasn't been done already? So the reason why this hasn't been done um, so actually, there's a lot of research on each of the individual um, eye movement types and speech analysis, but there's no way to actually combine them all into one exam, um, except for maybe about four or five years ago. We, I mean, we've made all these advances in artificial intelligence. I am in a unique position. I'm a cognitive psychologist and an AI researcher, so I knew exactly how to combine these. Um, I'm patenting that method. Um, and so that, I mean, that's basically the reason why no one has done it before. No one has, is in this space and also knows the methods to do it. Do you, um, do you have to have FDA approval before you can have this in wide use? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so actually, no. Um, if I were to say that you have Alzheimer's or you don't have Alzheimer's, I would need FDA approval and I would go, have to go through all the regulatory processing for that. But because we're only suggesting whether you have a likelihood or a risk factor, or only providing cognitive exam or cognitive ability scores, um, it's actually FDA exempt. So we wouldn't, we would have to still apply, but they would just tell us that it would be exempt. Okay, uh, just quick follow up. So um, this saves money by catching the disease earlier. And exactly. it, it, is, it can be treated at, at that point? So at the current, the current methods for detecting Alzheimer's before that brain damage, are very expensive, need a brain scan or a, some kind of a spinal tap, or um, it's, I mean, it, spinal taps are invasive or they're dangerous. Um, cognitive exams currently, they're not sensitive enough to actually detect it before they get Alzheimer's, but this is. So 
there's been a bunch of studies where we can detect it 10, 15 years in advance using some of these methods. So logically, if you take all of the methods and combine them, and we can do that use our, using our proprietary methods and our special exams, that uh, the tasks that we make, it's logical that we would get very accurate um, diagnosis for early detection. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next creator is Jordan Abacasis from Healthy no <laughs> the Health Knowledge. He is highlighting a multifaceted therapeutic workout enhancement elbow brace, which I believe he's wearing. Are yours? Let's see if the slideshow will play. So I am the CEO and founder of the Healthy Knowledge. My invention is the AEA wrap. So this is an all-in-one elbow accessory wrap or more specifically, a multifunctional therapeutic workout enhancement brace. My mom was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and I noticed that her hands began to cripple to the point where even opening up a water bottle became a difficult task. Now, let alone have her go ahead and exercise with any piece of equipment that required her to hold on to a bar or grip to go through a movement. The wrap that I'm wearing is constructed of soft, flexible, non-allergenic, and water resistant materials to allow for as much possible comfort to be placed on the elbow itself. On the brace, there are three rings connected, one in the interior, lateral, and exterior portions of the arm to allow for cable connections to be connected or removed to go through a multitude or a full range of functional workouts. Now, I have a, a small video right here that demonstrates all of the workouts, or at least just not all of the workouts, but some of the workouts that can be executed I don't know if I can get this to play. There we go. Okay. So as you can notice, the animation itself, I don't know if this is gonna play. The animation itself is holding on to the grips using his hands. Before my invention, there are no pieces of exercise equipment that would allow an individual to go through these movements without having to hold on to a bar or grip. Now this includes exercises of the chest, the shoulders, the back, and even exercises including the core or legs are now accessible for individuals who might not have this full function. Now, originally, I was only planning on this invention or this design to help my mom. I really didn't understand the scope, but I started to realize that there are so many other individuals who suffer from hand or wrist complications that could greatly benefit from a brace like this being on the market today. Now, to give you an example, individuals who also suffer from different forms of arthritis, neurological disorders, and um, even diabetes, individuals have problems holding or opening or closing their hands. But athletes, elderly individuals in physical therapy offices would also have a multitude or a, a complete range of workouts accessible to them that weren't offered before this brace. Thank you. Um, as for uh, patent, have you done any clinic, uh, clinical trials? Uh, I'm currently patent pending on both a non-provisional patent and a design patent. I am looking forward to working with actually FA Tech, F FAU Tech Runway to go ahead and file for a, um, an FDA approved study to show the efficacy of the brace itself to go through that I am accessing all forms of the muscle themselves and showing that it is a safer and easier alternative to compared to a hand grip. Have you estimated the size of the market in terms of uh, money-wise, what is the size? There are currently right now 50 million diagnosed hand or wrist complications uh, around the United States. That doesn't include anybody who doesn't go to a doctor to get that diagnosed. So as of right now, in the physical therapy market alone, there are 50 million targets that have either, that are either amputees, or diabetics that have problems, even for, um, patients with arthritis that have problems holding or using other forms of exercise equipment. So can you take me through the sales process? Like who would you be selling it to at what price and uh, so how's as of, as of right now, I would be selling it to, I think my largest market in South Florida is the physical therapists or the individuals who would like at-home gyms. 
So the physical therapist would be able to employ this product on each of their patients, not only have it in the office, but send it home with them as well to go through easy and safe functional movements without having to worry about hurting their client uh, at their home. I, the reason I say this is because by shortening the distance of a hand grip to place on the elbow, you're reducing the amount of torque that is placed on the joint itself, actually in half because of the, you're about halfway through the line. Now this, but still allowing all the blood flow and all the muscle contraction you would be getting through a conventional hand grip. Is this considered a medical device by the FDA? As it is, I have not gotten an FDA approval as a medical device. That is the next step that I would like to go. I want to create a medical solidified um, version to keep separate. So I, this would be my commercialized version and I would like to have a medical model that I'm currently in the mix of, of designing because I have the design patent and the, the non-provisional patents pending. But because I have that, I'm able to tweak the designs to have two separate markets. I would like the medical model to be much more sturdy, a little bit more complex, and uh, much safer even for their clients. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Aaron Kleinert of Strawfish. He has a mission of removing single-use plastics from our oceans, one straw at a time. And he brought gifts. Hello, I'm Aaron. And I'm Kyle. And we are Strawfish, an environmentally conscious social venture on a mission to remove single-use plastics from the environment. By a show of hands, how many of you guys have seen this video? We understand the graphic nature of this video, but unfortunately, it's the world we live in today. This right here is the reason Strawfish started. So it started by myself, Kyle, and one other friend. We're on a mission of finding and providing a sustainable alternative to single-use plastics. With this, we hope to educate the local community through universities and local councilmen to educate them on the single-use plastic bans that are rolling out and commit to local businesses by providing them this sus subsidized alternative for free. Recently, plastic straw bans and single-use plastic bans have been rolling out worldwide. We work with local nonprofits and local universities in order to continue educating and rolling out truly sustainable alternatives. So right now, when you think of a paper straw, they suck. And the reason why they suck is because the quality of the straw itself has given it a bad rep. So we've engineered our own paper straw that's gluten free and provided advertisers the opportunity to reach their target market through an innovative and eco branding intimate uh, experience. With this, every t shirt that is sold on our website allows people to become empowered as every t shirt will allow us to subsidize the cost of removing 2,500 plastic straws from circulation. So who do we help? We start with the advertisers, allowing them an intimate way to get in front of their target market for a longer period of time than a Facebook ad, as well as the restaurants that allows them to eliminate a completely an expense line from their end of the year reports, as well as the end user, providing them a great paper straw that's environmentally friendly as well as gluten free. So at the end of the day, part of our mission is to help educate the local community on alternatives because not all alternatives are sustainable. As you look towards a corn-based, 100% compostable plastic straw, at the end of the day, it has to be picked up by a very specific facility, and the only one in Florida is in Orlando. So every single straw at the end of every single shift at a restaurant or a hotel would have to be picked up by an employee, put in a bin, shipped up and paid for it to a facility in order to then have it biodegraded. So at the end of the day, the only option that's truly compostable is a paper straw that you could throw on the curb, which we hope you won't, but at the end of six weeks, it'll be completely gone. Get involved. You can go to our website, visit us on our website, as well as sign up for our beach cleanups that we do with local nonprofits. Buy a t-shirt. Like we said, it helps take 2,000, over 2,000 papers or plastic straws out of circulation and ask us how you can get free straws. Thank you very much. We're a Strawfish, and we hope to see you in the local community soon. Um, so are you a nonprofit or for-profit? We are not a nonprofit. At the end of the day, we need the funding that we have in order to subsidize and our own operations in order to fund 
getting employees out there to educate the local community, as well as subsidizing the cost for ourselves in order to give free product back to the community. Our business model is modeled off basically for Ocean. If you're familiar with their company, that's, that's kind of who we modeled our business after. And how much money you're looking to raise? We're looking to raise as, as much, like with this $2,500 from the with this, we're gonna buy our own straws with our own logos and just give them to free, just give them out to restaurants. Just go ahead and subsidize our own costs. The same thing we do with our t-shirts that we sell. Okay. So get into how you're gonna make money on this? So at the end of the day, every straw is an advertisement that is nine times cheaper than a Facebook ad and if you're going into Google Click Ads, it becomes a lot more. But we're selling the advertising space on the paper straw itself for an advertiser to eco-brand themselves inside their target market while giving the restaurants a free paper straw and cutting their expense line. Are there are enough um, spots here. I mean, you're putting in advertising on yes. this straw? Yep, it's gonna be, it'll be like usually either a website or something or the just eco-branding. Um, like with our first sale that we had um, on Monday, they'll be rolling out to Whale's Rib in Boca Raton. Bob's Pizza and Tilted Kilt uh, law firm, local law firm, has actually subsidized their entire straw usage for six months. And it's gonna, they just wanted to put their website on a straw. So our goal is basically when you unwrap the straw and see a website, your board sitting there waiting for your food, go to the website. So, find out, so one t-shirt, how many straws? 2,500 plastic straws. It allows us to buy, take this and buy 2,500 paper straws or buy back 2,500 plastic straws. What, what are your current sales right now? Uh, so right now, you could find the straw that you're drinking right now in Boca Raton Resort, in, in Ritz-Carlton's uh, Double Tree Hotels in uh, Miami and South Florida. The mission that we've started is a brand new mission in order to re-innovate the company and provide that eco-branding to other companies to help spread their mission. So we've just done 10,000 in revenue in our first three weeks. Okay, thank you. Our next creator is Juan Carlos Carrion of Home Hero. He has a solution for first time home buyers, preparing them for the financial process. To speak about his data driven product, welcome Juan. Tired of renting? Do you wonder if you are ready to own? Or if simply owning your first home is your dream, then listen up. Home Hero will soon let you become a homeowner. Hello, my name, my name is Juan Carlos Carrion and I'm the founder of Home Hero. Home Hero is a home purchase planning solution and marketplace for first time home buyers. And my bad. Sorry. Um, for first time home buyers today, finding the property online, very easy. However, securing the home financing, a different story. In fact, in 2018, the National Association of Realtors just released this information. Over 50% of home buyers aged 44 and under, and those making between 50 and $100,000, reported difficulty getting a home loan. And not just that, even if you get the loan, knowing if that loan is right for you, is still very problematic. In fact, almost 30% of first-time home buyers reported buyer's remorse when choosing a lender. But now there is a much better way with Home Hero. Home Hero simplifies the process and takes away all of the guessing and homework from the home financing process. And not just that, it even takes mortgage data and lets you know if the offer you're getting is the right offer for you. So our application eliminates stress during the mortgage origination process. So how does it work? We use financial data and machine learning to help you craft a roadmap to qualify for that mortgage financing. And once our algorithm uh, deems you mortgage ready, you are able to shop in our marketplace. And that's how we monetize. In the United States last year, there were over 5 million home buyers, over 380,000 of those here in Florida, and over 80,000 were first time home buyers. In the, in the mortgage industry, we have plenty of competitors. We have Rocket Mortgage and others. However, we differentiate ourselves because with, unlike Rocket Mortgage, we get, to, we get to competing offers from competing lenders. And unlike Zillow Marketplace or Lending Tree, we allow you to get the actual rates based on your actual data. None of those teaser rates. 
Today, we're asking for lenders and real estate companies uh, to become part of, of Home Hero. So thank you very much, and please help me into growing our communities and empowering aspiring home buyers to be their own heroes with Home Hero. Thank you. Um, what is your plan to get the word out and advertise once you get the lenders on board? Fantastic question. So we are doing this into two stages. In the seed stage, we're taking a more advisory and evangelistic approach. So we're working with a partnership with the Urban League of Broward County. They host first-time homebuyer workshops, and we hope to position our application as a companion to the services that they offer. Every single month, just the one in Broward County brings over 100 first-time homebuyers. We are planning to use that model and replicate it. Um, we're also working on partnerships with real estate agents. Real estate agents are the influencers for first-time home buyers. If the real estate agent says, hey, use this mortgage lender, first-time home buyers listen to them. So what we're doing is we're actually creating an application for real estate agents as well to distribute to their first-time home buyers. That way, real estate agents can focus their attention on those customers that are ready to transact while still creating value for those other customers that may be at the top of the funnel, six months, eight months, or 12 months away from, uh, from uh, transacting. So that's the approach that we're, we're taking. Um, right now, our, our main goal is to set up a beachhead in the Tri-County area, Broward, um, Broward, Miami, and the Palm Beaches. Once we get that set up, we're hoping to, we're hoping to expand to all of Florida and then use online channels to reach out uh, nationwide. Application ready? Right now, we are on our prototype stage. Um, Sorry, I thought I could show you more, more slides. Uh, we are bringing first-time home buyers because we are, we are um, entering that stage where we're about to build it, and we want to make sure that we're building the right thing. I'm bootstrapping this, this myself, and right now we are a team of three, and we continue to, to work towards discovering the truth. So is your um, revenue going to be based on a percentage of the mortgage amount, or how's that going to work? No, we actually get a fee per action. So when a first time home buyer actually, our algorithm deems them mortgage ready, they go into our marketplace, they request a quote, and that's when we get paid by the lenders, just by for providing the, the quote. That, is that fee from the lender, is that just a finder's fee or is it a, a mortgage broker or something? That will be part of the origination fees that lenders currently charge. And, and say a $500,000 mortgage, what would you get? Uh, right now, we are, we are still testing the business model, but we are thinking that we can get around $300 just from the origination. Now, two years down the road, what we are thinking about is actually doing the full funding ourselves because we believe that currently, the infrastructure for first-time home buyers is based on an old paradigm where you work for the same company for 10 years. That's not happening anymore. I talk with many of you about, for instance, software engineers. They are jumping from job to job. They are not even staying on the same job for two years. And most lenders will require you at least two years to qualify for financing. And that's why Rocket Mortgage is actually making a killing. However, you know, when you go to Rocket Mortgage, they will be happy to sell you the mortgage. If you want to know if that is a good mortgage, you got to start the process all over again. We are eliminating that. Thank you. <laughs> Our next creator is Ernest Vasquez of Reef Cells. He developed an ocean-friendly material to accelerate coral reef growth. My name is Ernest Vasquez. I'm an author. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so we make molds of people. We had a commission to do a mermaid for a big yacht. So what ended up happening is the guy lost the yacht, lost his business, divorced his wife, everything, and I have this mermaid ready to deliver to him. I said, what do you want me to do with this? And he goes, I don't care, throw it in the ocean. So I kind of do some research. I find out people have been putting sculptures in the ocean, and they use them for artificial reefs. So the idea with artificial reefs are there's a lot of damage to coral reefs around the world. I don't know if you guys know this, but here in Florida, there's 360 miles of coral reefs. In the last 20 years, 40% of those reefs have died. 
Um, our idea is to create artificial reef structures that are shaped like this, as coral reef modules, and this is already being done now, and creating um, mermaids that combine with these to create fish habitat, places for people to dive, educational stuff like that. Um, globally, coral reefs are $36 billion industry with dive and tourism. In the next 20 years, we can see coral reefs being gone completely. So, go ahead, questions? Um, do you plan to sell these to the city, or how are you going to make money? Okay, so right now we're applying for a nonprofit. We're in 501c3 pending. What we hope to do is a couple different ways: is have people purchase these as memorial objects. Maybe have um, different counties, like right now Palm Beach County, things they have funds for, it, as well as hotels that might want to have coral reefs or have um, dive centers at their hotels. Uh, Fort Lauderdale Beach is our first dive site. We have. 40 feet out in the water, we'll be planning these, and we have interest of in different private companies that want to make reefs to sponsor them as like a, a bulletin board or a, something in the water that people show people go tourists. How much does it cost to actually do a setup? Okay, so an individual model, an individual module would be about $2,500 for us and about seven grand um, for set, uh, retail price. But there's an economy of scale. The more you make, the cheaper it gets because it's just material. It's concrete, rebar, and limestone. So the more you make, the larger this project gets. It's just like building roads. It gets cheaper. Yeah. Oh. Um. So has this, have you actually done this and proved that it works? Yes, they're doing these modules all over the world now. They're making artificial reef modules that are used for research purposes and coral aggregation, and that's happening. What we're doing is combining artistic elements to it for divers to go see. If you think about it like this, um, you have a natural reef and you can put coral on it, plant the coral, but if divers still go and dive on that, the foot traffic destroys the reef. What we want to do is give divers an alternative to go see an environmental art project, like a gallery underwater, and get them off the natural reef and onto the artificial reef. To date, we've made 22 modules. They're about 3,500 pounds each, and we've been working with Broward County. We got permits and everything to put them in the water. The money we hope to raise now is going to go towards the 501c3 so we can do it on a larger scale. And who did the funding for this now? Uh, myself. Oh. Yeah, we, we were building them in our backyard to start, and then we've since paired with a guy that had been making them in Jupiter, Florida already. He's letting us use his warehouse, and so that's the stage we're at now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next creator is Stephen Fleischer of Two Degrees, created an algorithm utilizing geolocation phone and contacts to advertise daily deals. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. My name is Steven Fleischer, and the name of my company is Two Degrees. I'm the founder and CEO, and I'd like to tell you about my company. Two Degrees is a daily deals app that radically improves the revenue of small businesses. We have one main competitor, and that's Groupon. Let me tell you why Groupon sucks. <laughs> they require, it's funny, but it's true. They require businesses to do a very deep discount on products that they sell, and then they take half of the revenue. The other half of the revenue is held onto for an extended period of the time so the businesses don't see it for a while. They provide limited data to the merchants, and the merchants have nowhere else to go. They're stuck. For the users, it's a bad experience. Groupon's a bad experience for the users because they have to pay for the deals in advance, and when they expire, they lose their money. Here's our solution. We are the only SaaS pricing model for daily deals. Our patented software technology is a viral, is a viral application engine. Excuse me, a viral acquisition engine. That's what our secret sauce is. Merchants set the discounts on two degrees. They choose their discounts, they choose their prices, unrestricted, and the merchants get all the revenue from the deals. Merchants no longer have to wait to receive their money, and they're provided with very meaningful reports and analytics on the Two Degrees platform. Benefits to the users, they don't have to pay for the deals in advance, take money out of their pocket, and the deals, they don't lose their money if deals expire. 
We have paying customers. We're very happy with the results. There's a VC in Florida who is interested in making an investment in our company. They asked us to do a case study at a restaurant called So Fresh that they have an interest in. They ran a deal on Two Degrees for three days. Their expectations were for 10 new customers. Time's up or I have one more minute? Oh. They, they were expecting 10 new customers. The results were 120 new customers. And the deal was exposed to over 4,500 people. The daily deals market is a $5 billion industry. Um, growth 20% year after year after year. And Groupon owes more than half of that. There's 10 million small businesses, and the Groupon merchants are looking to switch. They're looking for something new, and there's no cost to switch to two degrees. 50 million users, digital coupons are on the rise. Mobile devices are on the rise. Groupon stock is going down, and two degree stock is going up. <laughs> Thank you. What is your current market? Are you? or have you been expanding, and what is your current market size? Sure. We're following the constant contact model on how they scaled. We're starting with feet on the street locally, and then we're gonna convert into a digital model and scale nationally. So do you have any projections on uh, what your revenue is gonna be next two or three years? When what, revenue what? Next two or three years projections. Oh, so at the end of 2009, by the end of 2019, we're expecting about 450,000, two and a half million in 2020, and about 12 million in 2021. So how do you value your company today? What would you be uh, like a value to the company? Uh, the, how would you value pre-money, post-money? Where are you in that stage? Oh, our last round was at $8 million valuation. And we realize that's a little bit high. So um, the next round we raise will probably be a down round. So um, explain how you drive uh, customers to businesses. Right, so that's our algorithm, the patented algorithm. The way- How does it work? The way traditional ads work is a business puts out an ad on Facebook or Snapchat, or Instagram, or Instagram or paid search, and they pay to reach a certain demographic, age, gender, location. We're a little bit different. So what we have patented is this heterogeneous network where an advertiser can reach out, their ad or deal discount can, promotion can reach the second degree network of customers. And it creates exponential growth if 10 people redeem a deal instead of their friends getting a coupon from the store, they get a coupon from their friends and it says that their friends redeem this coupon at the store so they automatically assume that it's a good place and it creates a socially driven behavior. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we have Frank Hauger, a three-in-one frame. He's showcasing custom software for photo editing. Frank? Hi, how are you? This is the very first public viewing of our product, so it's brand new. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit about first, first me. I'm kind of an obsessive person, and I love photos. And uh, I like to look at them on Facebook. I like to look at them on Instagram. I'm like men, mostly with my family and special moments when I see my friends enjoying themselves, etc. When um, I was a father and raising my kids, my dad, uh, my son at some point would say, Dad, enough photos, enough photos. And I would get carried away with the camera. Well, now that I'm a grandfather, I get to do that all over again. One of the, the funniest things is I would uh, video chat with my granddaughter and she learned very quickly at nine months old how to reach over and, and disconnect the video chat because I was always snapping photos of using the camera to snap the photos as we're talking. So photos aren't just pixel, pixels on a screen or they're not ink on a paper. It's how you, they make you feel. And that's what the value of a photo is. So it doesn't matter if you're you know 12, if you're 20, 50, 60, 80, everybody loves photos. And, um, and the problem is that I had so many photos, I couldn't decide which ones to choose. I couldn't decide how to display them all or where to put them. So when I was in Cuba, I was visiting Cuba, and it's like going back in time. And there, I couldn't see 
all the digital stuff we have today. There's not all these screens. There's not digital frames. There's not the advertising we have. And I saw something that gave me this idea. So this is a three-in-one frame with my daughter's wedding. And where you're standing in the room lets you see a different picture. So the question is, how does that make you feel? If a picture is worth a thousand words, then three photos tells a story. And this is the story of a young lady with the two men in her life, her, her father-daughter dance and her new husband cutting the cake. So like I said, this is our first presentation, so i um, a little nervous and I get a little active and, and excited about this stuff. But I've got some frames as examples for you to take a look at. There's family pictures, a couple as they're going through their romance. Here's in more of a family and you can see different pictures from different size. Now, how would you like to see your family and your special moments captured in those three-in-one frames? So, one of the things about these, they're space-saving. You can pick a few of your favorite photos and put them in there. And they change frames and photos into wall art. And uh, we've got one of these that you've all seen. I'll need those back because we're showing them tomorrow. <laughs> I would have made one for each of you, but <laughs> good, I like it. We can arrange that after the show. Great. So we have a few more to show, and Saul is going to help me here. Right. Um, answer some of your questions. You know, you can answer some of their questions now. Your Thank time you. has been up. Thank you. So I'll, I'll defer to some questions. So um, what does it cost you to make one of those, and what do you sell it for? We will find out more about the price point tomorrow. It's our first exposure. That's what we're here to do is to really establish. We believe what we would like to see the price point at. Um, we haven't sold these yet. I've actually had a friend uh, buy one. Um, and, and another acquaintance bought two. She paid 120 for one, 180 for the other. And uh, 180 was about this size. So what do you, uh, would I email you a photo and then you send me back the frame? Yes, we have or the software. I didn't really have time to go into the software. That it's 3D software that you load three photos in. It shows you three photos. It can generate uh, amazing printouts. For instance, this is a three watches split up. Grab the three watches in there, if you would. Three watches split up. And then we can print this on large paper and generate three watches. Um, we have automatic cutting software. Here's one of a dessert. OK. Do you have any IP on, on Yes, the we do. We actually have a US patent filed that's going to get fast tracked. It was actually done by FIU as part of their startup program and, or their, their law curriculum program, and we have an international PCT filed. And that includes the way we're doing the fillets, the way we're doing the lampshade, the clamshells, the, everything that goes inside the frame, and even the frame designs themselves. It's, they had 40-some <laughs> individual entries, and including I know, software. I know you're just starting. What is your production capacity? Like, how many could you make? What, what is your scale? We are right now making these ourselves. And um, once we... One of the things that Charles talked about was making sure people will buy it. Everyone loves it. Tomorrow we're going to find out, and maybe from the crowd today, if people want to actually buy it. So that's our goal. We have a survey we'll do, do tomorrow, and I've talked to a friend of a friend who is a frame manufacturer. He's willing to move it forward. And the lady across the street who made our T-shirts tomorrow is actually very excited about helping us make these as well. We can ramp up from there. We think the big market is superheroes, uh, princesses, uh, things like that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Mike McGrath from 3-in-1 Roof Incorporated. Mike has presented his patented core roofing product, which offers a combination of wind, hail, fire protection while improving energy efficiency. They also brought lots of props. <laughs> People got to see it. Put this on the other side of the table there. Yep. Extra mic. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I had help for him. Come on, your six. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike McGrath, as you mentioned. I'm here to present on behalf of 3 in 1 Roof Incorporated, along with our CEO and inventor, uh, Mr. Carmen Bellavia, here, who's here with me. So, 3 in 1 Roof is a Florida based corporation focused on the development and distribution of our patented high performance roofing system. Now, this, uh, this roofing system is unlike anything else that you've ever seen before, including our competitors. We actually hold patents on it in 43 different countries around the world, including and beginning with the USA right here. So let's start about you know, why this is relevant. Oh, where's my clicker? Right on the edge, right there. Right. Let's talk about why this is relevant. So over the past five to 10 years, the rising cost of natural disasters has uh, driven high performance building systems to the top of not just consumers' minds, but building code officials' minds as well, as well as insurance companies. And however, uh, these solutions are often very, very cost prohibitive. And they're not only desired, but required in many markets, including you might have seen some developments in California recently. Uh, this is causing builders, contractors, and developers to actively seek out new technologies which will allow them to deliver these performance standards at costs which are still achievable and attainable by their customer base. Without, with uh, zero, basically zero improvements in the last several decades, the roof continues to be the weak link in this chain. Where this new technology is needed, the 3-in-1 roof is the industry's supreme roofing solution. We named it the 3-in-1 roof because it targets three key areas of building performance in one product, and those are extreme weather performance, uh, improve, improvements to the thermal envelope, reducing, you know, improving the energy efficiency of the, of the product, of the home, I mean, and an integrated solar solution as the cherry on top. Now, I'm going to refer to my notes here. So that high performance, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about that real quick, because uh, as a foam body core, a lot of people have questions about that. But our product offers not just 200 mile per hour wind resistance, but top of class, highest in the class, fire protection because it is self-extinguishing, highest in class hail protection because of that foam body core in terms of protecting the interior of the structure, and, um, and the solar upgrade, as I mentioned, as the cherry on top, which is optional. But this product offers, even in situations where the solar isn't viable, it still brings value to the contractors and consumers. You know, for instance, if there's shade over a structure and they, don't, they can't incorporate solar because it doesn't make sense, and it brings this value to the customer and the contractor because it is lightweight, so it can retrofit any existing structure. It's easy to install using a speedy foam and go. Um, I'm gonna skip that slide. Uh, using a speedy foam and go installation process, and it's got curb appeal, which is second to none. So this unique combination of benefits allows us to not only address the rooftop uh, manufacturing market, but also the global roofing solar installation market, combining to a total addressable market of $134 billion today, and we're expecting that to increase to $161 billion within the next four years. Mike, we're going to have our... Uh our, our judges ask you some questions now, okay? Okay, absolutely. Uh, do you have any sales right now, and how do you compare with existing roofs? We have, we have more sales than we could accommodate installations for. Uh, reason being that the, uh, our startup factory is in Ohio, and it's an 8,000 square foot factory capable of producing about uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, six to 700,000 square feet of product annually. Uh, we've already sold that for 2019 and 20, and we're looking to uh, ramp up production so we could, by within five years, so we could accommodate 12 million square feet of uh, product for installation. So to put that in perspective, that rep, you know the orders we've received so far represent over 1.4 million dollars, and that's off of basically zero, you know, less than 5,000 dollars in advertising spend through press releases and a little bit of 
you know, pay-per-click advertising just to tell yeah. the budget. Are the yeah. sales to general contractors, roofers, or direct to consumer for now? Right now, the cell, our sales are basically are primarily early adapters, people who want to get get a solar solution but don't want to have uh, solar panels on their roofing system. So, uh, is the majority of your sales with the solar? Almost 100 percent, which we were surprised by, but that's the way it's done. And what kind of uh, kilowatt hours? Or, uh, can you get from that? So each of these modules is rated at 50, 50 watts per module, and then the total rate power rating of the entire system just is, I mean, that's up to the consumer. If they want 10% coverage, 20% coverage, 30% coverage. 100%. 100% if that's what they want. I mean, we've got somebody, some people building marinas and things like that that are going to be just one slope, pitched south across the whole. So that's about the whole 100% coverage is viable in those sorts of situations. So. It, it's fully customizable for the for the customer's needs. We also have a very uh, uh, nice ab ab ability to actually conceal the solar, just like you would uh, put tint on your windows of your car. We have a tinting pro a process where the the laminate is is uh, manufactured and and uh, uh, printed with this in the same color, one of twelve colors that we offer, as well as the 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 line that would go uh, through it. So when it's done, now this one doesn't have a solar in it, but uh, so when it's done. It just like a, a regular tile with the uh, maybe like a shadow area where the solar is um, you know, coming through the laminate. Just like if you tinted your car windows, you could still see somebody inside of it, kind of like the same thing. But it, the, we trademark that concealed solar. So are all your sales then to, in Florida? Or you uh, located surprisingly, in Surprisingly, yeah, most of our sales are in Florida because this has a 200 mile an hour wind resistance as well as uh, an ability to stop all thermal gains from entering into the attic. The core of our product, being made of foam, eliminates the sun from penetrating it and going into the attic space and heating your attic up all day long, which in turn in, in Florida heats up all the duct work, which makes your energy efficiency of your furnace drop considerably. And, and this solves that problem. So why are you located in Ohio? Dayton. Why? <laughs> it just worked out. Everybody asked me that. That's where our chief it engineer just worked is, out. It just is worked out that way, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, you know, they, we, we do want to move. Uh, Dayton is not that, you know, much of a... And there's, there's no reason why we only need one facility. We can have several. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we're looking to license the product out to uh, companies like Owens Corning and, and other big manufacturers out there uh, who, who, who love the product but told us get it on 50 homes first and then we'll talk. So our, our main ambition this year is to put it on about 30 to five, 30 or 40 homes before the end of the summer, which we're going to start, uh, we're going to start production for the, uh, the entire uh, system April 1st. Okay. We've come a long way. It's been 10 years on, in development. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, oh, am I on? I'm on now. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for our creators who presented tonight. It took an immense amount of courage to come up and do this. Tomorrow we'll announce the two winners during our C City of Coral Springs Unplugged event. One will be selected by our judges. Can we have a round of applause for our judges, please? The other one will be selected by you. So get out there and vote. Also tomorrow, don't forget we have an event with live music, food, funky Buddha's brewery, which is weird, live audience right here from 6 to 10 p.m. See you all tomorrow. Thank you so very much for coming tonight. Mike. With the judges, we're. Nervous and forgot to give you the handout.